What's up? Hello. Hello, everybody. Welcome hey, um, to the stream. Joined here by my best buddy, Dan. What's going on, folks? Dan's streaming now. I am. I streamed for 11 hours today, so maybe you might have been there. <laughs> if you I ever want to for... sit there. Yeah, there's a few 10-hour streams this week. Yeah. There's no stream tomorrow, unless it's late, because I got I to gotta travel tomorrow. But other than that, it's pretty much every day. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to be drawing some comics tonight, as usual. Uh, the only things I was going to mention up front... As I'm doing more Patreon stuff, so I'm sure patrons will be happy to hear that because it's been a while. I've been deep in the trenches working on Diablo stuff for a while. Mm -hmm. So this is the painting I just worked up for my, not really a basics video, but a basics video. If you're ever, if you're familiar with any of those things that I do on my Patreon, I walk through the entire process of where I'm currently at in my step-by-step -step of like painting. And uh, I did this Venom painting that's basically me going off of everything that I've been doing for uh, Diablo and that style. And I just wanted to show you how I'm doing that. So the two, this is a two hour or so painting. And that's, I think that's basically as long as the video is. And uh, yeah. As soon as I can wrap up the voiceover for that, that'll be up on Patreon, so look out for it. And then um, I have like other stuff lined up as well that I already put together. I just wanted to drop chunks every day for like a week, just because it's been so long. So thanks for hanging out, sticking with me, being a part of the Discord, and everybody being so kind. But yeah, I'll be hopping over into the comic now. I just wanted to share that, show you. There you go. So what up? What's up? Well, today was a beautiful day here. Nice. It's warm. It's very nice. And uh, spent some time outside with the kids. Got the shit beat out of me with swords. That was pretty dope. Hell yeah, dude. Hell yeah. <laughs> Hell they just, yeah. They got these like uh Renaissance fair like wooden swords. Nice. And um they just chase me around the yard and I have like I have one of those like Knights Templar <laughs> white mm. cross shields that we also Hell got yeah. from there. And they just the hammer me with their swords. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, that's fun. And then we went on a a bike ride after dinner going all around and trying to navigate the sh like the shady areas of Colorado like the snow doesn't melt there at all like it stays like cool because it's so dry there's no humidity mm -hmm. so like it'll seem like it's a summer day and then you'll whip around a corner on your bike and there's just like snow everywhere <laughs> like what the fuck is this do you know if any um do you know if any like fruiting trees grow there like if I sent you something for your yard, like the apple trees and shit grow there? Oh yeah, there's a ton of apple trees. Cool. We have like a, a shitload of apple trees, like a, the trail that we ride down on our bike in the summertime. I was the thinking fall, of- Closer to the fall, yeah. you can ride around and pick apples. Getting you guys like a Meyer lemon tree or an apple tree or something for the yard? Uh, we wanted to do a lemon tree for indoors. Yeah, they're great indoors. Mine is like always, every year I get like probably 20 off it. Yeah, we have like a really sunny living room area. Nice. So that, yeah, that would be awesome. We were we were talking about getting one for cool. a while. Let me see yeah, here. We've just been doing a bunch of bunch of parent stuff. Oh, I was um, I wanted to mention this. You've probably seen it already, but we haven't talked about it, so I wasn't sure. Um. Okay. Dan DeSalt showed me this uh, comic called Witch Hat Atelier. Have you seen that? Uh, yeah, I have that. Dude, the panels are so good. The like, the like page breaks and stuff that guy does. Oh my god. Yeah, I have a a bunch of those. Books. So good. 
So good. Such a good style. I just yeah. found those like a couple weeks ago and they're like incredible. Yeah, I have a I have a bunch of like random books. Whenever I see somebody I, I really like, I just immediately just seek it out, buy a copy. Yeah, there's a there's some um, God, I'm trying to think of this other artist. It has this like a amazing style. Uh, who is it? They they just did a comic called Veil. Like the same thing oh. that I named mine. And somebody Weird. was asking like about it. They were like, Did you name I was like, Well, mine's from like twenty thirteen. <laughs> it's so. from a Crimson Daggers challenge we did where we came up with names. Yeah. And Veil like, wasn't cool enough on its own. And then we did Star Veil. And eh, Veil's pretty cool. And yeah, that's an old name. Yeah, yeah. But their comic is called Veil. And it's it's really cool. It's like very beautiful. Well, as long as you get 10% for the royalty use of the name. I mean, <laughs> that's what it takes. <laughs> I think Star Veil, though. Like, I, I remember back in the day, like, looking it up. And I think mm -hmm. like the only other thing that existed it that was Starvale related was like a My Little Pony fan fiction. <laughs> I didn't even think it was. I didn't think it was anywhere. It, I didn't it think isn't, any it isn't really. Not like officially, it's not anywhere. Yeah. I don't, but I think there's like a Starvale My Little Pony thing. Someone, someone asked me today if I could recap the drama with um what happened back in the day with Jason Manley. Oh man. And I couldn't even remember where it began. I didn't know, like, did it start with him closing the atelier? Is that where it began? Well, for anybody who has no idea what we're talking about, yeah, this is the dude who ran Massive Black, the concept art outsourcing studio. And um, they also had a website called conceptart.org where you could participate, post art. And that's where a lot of artists that you probably know today uh, got yeah. their start. That's where I got my start. Um, That's where most people did for a long time. But uh, yeah, that that was. I don't know where it started. It was. I think it started around people not getting paid because they they used to do a thing mm -hmm. where you could like if you were like a big artist in that community and you had some clout you could be a part of this like ranked system that was like at the top of the site where they'd have a bunch of artists that were, you know, quote unquote famous just in that field. And you yeah. could, they would have a thing where they'd like make a, a, like a downloadable piece of content for you and they'd like put it out and you'd get money from that. That was like the plan. I know and he I, was. And I think it kind of started around that because he wasn't paying people. So, okay, so I knew that that was part of it. I didn't know the chronology because at some point he shut down and fucked over the safe house and Carla and all those people got screwed over. And then when people were talking about the safe house thing on the forums, he started banning all the accounts that were criticizing him. Yes. And people started making those names like Jason Banley, Jason Misunderstandly, Jason couldn't handle it, so he ran Lee. <laughs> Just like a million, like... And then he, then he 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 said he he hijacked the email list when uh, I think when Mesa Black fired him he hijacked the email list and locked him out of the conceptart.org website. I mean, and started spam emailing everybody to like buy he's this. Nothing. Buy he's nothing this. if not an incredible businessman. Dude, <laughs> dude, yeah, I I couldn't even remember all of the stuff. And then I know was did all of it go public or is some of it still private? All A the bunch. crazy shit. I don't know how much of it went public. I yeah, know that a lot of the it. court documents did of, of like the weird like prostitution stuff. Okay, that's what I didn't know specifically if it was public, but since you just pretty, said pretty, it. I'm pretty sure. That's what I didn't want to say was the prostitution. Don't, well, don't get into it if it's not. Okay. Cause I, I said allegedly a thousand times. Yeah, alleged. Allegedly. Alleged prostitution. <laughs> I, I really don't know. Here you go, chat. Look it up. And if you find it, it's public. <laughs> but... Hey, allegedly. It, it was wild, I know that. And then the thing that finally It's a broke dangerous up. thing to talk about because Dan and I are we were on the inside of that. So like <laughs> we know a lot of stuff and I don't know where what I know like yeah. what's public and what I know. I don't know that line. Yeah. And then I think the thing that finally broke because the site was dividing up into factions based on what Jason was doing, and then 
as far as I remember, the last the last real thing that broke it was when Brad came out and Brad was like, this guy fucked me over and didn't pay me my royalties for my tutorial. And that was when that mega thread happened. Yeah. That like everybody was on. Yeah, that was like, and then that was it. I don't think it ever, I think that was, everyone started deleting their stuff after that. It's such a bummer to you because that site was so good. Oh, and then the best thing, some people who tried to delete their sketchbook threads, like their famous ones, he wouldn't let them delete them because he was, <laughs> he wanted the traffic to the site. He like forced Hannes's sketchbook to be there in perpetuity. Those were really fun. It took the permissions away from people. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. Anyway, guys, sorry. Whoever asked that earlier, there's so much there that like I'd have to get Dave and Carla and like Cake Eye in a room and we'd all remember pieces of it, but I don't think any of us remember <laughs> all of it because there was so much on so many fronts. Yeah, it was it was it was funny. I mean, you know, for us yeah, not in being retrospect, totally involved for watching no, Rome no, at, the, at the time. It was, it was funny. Yeah, I was enjoying it. Well, you had to. We had to laugh. It was too. Even my insane. dad was enjoying it. My my dad yeah. at the time, he was like checking in on the forums. Yeah, and he it was, was just like nuts. He was like that thing you said was so funny, and I was like, yeah. thanks, dad. <laughs> Thank He's you. He's like, you're really making fun of him. I was like, yeah. You really showed him. I just remember we photoshopped that gif of the guy shooting the flaming arrow at the end of season two of Game of Thrones and blowing up the boat. We put it in the Brad things. It was Brad shooting it. <laughs> and I just remember everyone, everyone who's anyone was posting in that thread shitting on Jason. And it was, yeah, man. Anyway, sorry. Just had to, had to see if you remembered any more tidbits. Yeah, that was fun. Let me see if Chad has any questions here. How large do my lemon trees grow indoors? Pretty big. Uh, the size of like a full tree if you have the space and enough light. They'll basically just keep going as long as you have space and light. Um, let's see. AAABBB says, my brother in Christ, this is literally the coolest, most unique art style I've ever seen. Holy shit, I need an anime slash comic series of this. Thanks. What's I the feel comic like name? I am uh, sorry. I feel like I'm just like, like secretly, like inside me is like a really weird, <laughs> like French artist. Probably. <laughs> like that, like a that's like what's like in, that's like what's in me somewhere, and I just need to like keep digging because I yeah, feel there's... like this is like the most fun I have is doing these types of things. There's a Mobius buried under 20 years of people telling you that's lame. Well, the thing that's like, the thing I always come back to is like, I work in games and like, I'll do a ton of concept art for stuff. And every time I go with like my gut, mm. I, I get, and it's no, it's nothing to like, you know, say anything bad about anybody. It's, it's not that at all because it's not my thing that I'm working on. I'm just a part of it. But like, I have weird ideas. Like a lot of my like initial stuff is is real weird, and like I tame it down as the project goes on. And like, it happens so much that I'm just like I need I just need to do projects like this that like are all me. That I can just be weird. I don't need to like explain to anybody why something makes sense, or that like people will get it or whatever. I can just be weird, like don't get committed to death. Yeah, like people just going like, but I don't understand like how this. It's like I, I don't want to have to sit here and convince you why this. Because it's not for you. <laughs> <laughs> you have everything. But it's happened to me like a lot, and I just am, you know, it always comes back to like make your own stuff and like you know, mm -hmm. trust your instincts. People will get it. Sean Fuqua says, hello, Dave. Hope you've been well. I'm doing another composition piece for this year, and I'm almost finished number three. Just wanted to say I appreciate your feedback on everyone's stuff. It helps. Of course. I'm happy to do it. Yeah, the this last round and the composition challenge we did on Discord, I did paintovers of everybody's stuff. Um, 
I mean, I still have two streams left of that, which I'll be doing shortly in the next, hopefully tomorrow if I can make some time. But yeah. Spookat says, question for Dave, when inking a sketch, do you go about conceptualizing the final inks by feel, like referencing the lines you've just put down, or do you imagine how it'll be even before you start? Uh, hmm, I have an idea before it starts, and then I just, I, I kind of just understand generally what I want, but then I let myself discover stuff along the way. And if something feels cooler, then I, I lean into that. But generally speaking, I know what I'm doing completely. It's just a matter of like, just execution. Execution might be a little different, you know, like I might end up inking it a, like a slightly different way than I initially anticipated. But in general, it's, it's the same as the initial sketch. And then uh, as I like refine, like certain things change, like, uh, if you look at this panel here, um, I'll show you the original. So like I'll start my, my sketch will be this little thumbnail and this kid's crying into his hands here. And it's, it's very like symmetrical in this shot and kind of emotionless. So mm -hmm. then what I think is I'm like, okay, that's fine as a placeholder. But when I get into doing the actual sketch, I want to make it a little, I want his emotion to be a little messier than that. So like I, I move the hands around and I mess up his hair and I try and make it like he's really in his hands and just, yeah, like stuff like that is like the feeling and anatomy and that sort of thing. And the same with like this shot here with him looking at his palms. Like I just want to make sure it feels more uh, like it has more character to it so that's more or less what i'm thinking about when i'm inking mm -hmm. or just like refining stuff i think the answer to this is the chrome brush but lily my lou wants to know since you get this question all the time what is the what brush is that the chrome brush yeah that's what i figured it's the sketching chrome brush and critter oh uh, let's see what else we got the asks Thoughts on Craig Mullins advising artists to become plumbers and seek managerial positions. He said there's no way you'll be able to earn money doing what he does in the future. What a loser. Uh, I get what he's saying, but it's it, that's a bit short-sighted. I yeah. think it's I think he's uh, you know, no not to knock Craig Mullins, but there is a certain oldness to what that is. That's um, I mean, I love his work, but what a bad attitude. Yeah, like people, again, I, I go back to like hamburger places. Hmm. McDonald's came around. You can still get a good hamburger somewhere else. Like the, it's not like it's like it definitely got rid of a lot of stuff. Sure. But it's, but it's not the end of it. It's like, yes, will there will you have a hard time finding an art career if you just want to do tile sets for a video game and gets all your painting? Absolutely those kinds of like yeah assets just placeholder jobs yeah like assets. You're, yeah it's like you're not the iconic artist painting the main scene and all this stuff yes that'll go away but i think in terms of what i do like this thing that you're seeing right here this isn't going anywhere like yeah. this like people making comics and original stuff like and then being <clears throat> like iconic artists like Craig Mullins isn't going anywhere. No, that's such a, I don't know. It's such a bummer. I love Craig's stuff. That's the only reason I had that reaction. It's such a, it's such a sad thing for him to say to people that look up to him. That's so, I don't know. Well, it's that's, just that's a like a, f whenever anybody starts speaking f like a fear-based mindset, Yeah. just ignore it. People, you know, like I I've told this story before that like when I, initially got into doing like art like I, I talked to artists uh who were reviewing my portfolio and they were like what do you want to do and I was like well I like doing like portraiture and stuff for characters and that sort of thing like I feel like I'm good at that and they're like oh you'll never make a career doing just that like you need to do like a number of other things and then I became a portrait guy who like then I got like a name from I just didn't listen to people 
Like you can't listen to people who come out and say, it's not going to work out for you because of my anecdotal evidence that I'm just kind of piecing together out of fear. It's like, no. What if he's what if he's, what if he's doing a whiplash and he's like, listen, you're never going to be great. It's okay. What if it's like, what if it's like a reverse psychology? That's fine. But I just, <laughs> but I just think like fear mongering stuff is yeah, it it's just bad. It's like the, the, the other thing that I think that statement is kind of wrong is just the idea that like other people don't see it or value art anymore it's like no if you just like go on instagram go on instagram mm -hmm. and look at posts where there's ai art like the people who don't even know anything about art they look at mm -hmm. it and they go oh i'm so fucking sick of this ai shit like it's the same thing as like flooding the market with any product. It's just noise. Like now, now people are just sick of it. It's so easy. It's so cheap. It's so just blah. It doesn't matter anymore. It's like it's already losing that oomph that it had in the beginning of like, whoa, it's what's doing, this crazy it's doing, thing? Yeah, it's doing the NFT thing. It's just becoming boring. It's just too much of it. Yeah. People at the end of the day people like people uh, for context, i really think that <laughs> carl zetting says i don't know craig personally but he does sometimes have a hard to uh hard to discern sense of humor it might not take that comment literally i took his class through underpain a few months ago i hope so yeah i hope that's true i hope that's what it is miguel says if you weren't in my chat earlier this won't make any sense he says sup everyone the brussels sprouts are almost done got some rosemary mashed potatoes <laughs> that's good man they're gonna love that with the tomahawk steak at the dinner party you're going to good job uh the video game sable anyone else love the graphics of that yeah the graphics are great i wish the uh i don't know if it was on everything or just ps5 that game crashes so much it can't like handle if there's more than like a few polygons in an area, it just crashes. It's such a bummer because it's so beautiful. But. Hmm. Let's see. Any other questions? I downloaded that like uh, Sandland demo, the Kira Toriyama one. Hmm. The way that they do the uh, graphic style is really cool, but that game is so boring. <laughs> it's crazy. <Yeah. laughs> it's nothing yeah. happens. Yeah. It's such a janky, like, indie game feel. It just it, crashes it feels like, like crazy. No, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. Sandland? What? Oh, Sandland. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sandland's the Akira Toriyama game. Yeah, I didn't play that. What what's wrong with it? What's it doing? It's just boring. Like it's a beautiful oh. looking like graphic style. It looks like Akira Toriyama's inks and and like that stuff's really successful. But then What are you doing it? You can it's like a capsule corp type of thing where you you have like capsules with machines in them and you can oh. like pop them out and you can be in a in like a little like like a classic Akira Toriyama, like chubby mech that like fist fights. Mm. You can be in something like that. Or you can be in a tank or you can be in like a really cool, like almost like roll cage motorcycle. And That's too uh, bad. Be it's, super fun. It, it's really cool looking like at the idea that is great, but like it feels so rushed. <laughs> it feels like That's an asset bad. flip game. That sucks. Johnny Pearson has an important question. He says, dude, am I supposed to lift my front foot when I do a kick flip or does it stay stuck to the grip tape before I kick? Before you kick? You... Am I supposed to lift my front foot when I do a kick flip or does it stay stuck to the grip tape before I kick? It's the same sort of thing as when you ollie. When you ollie, you're popping the board and turning your foot sideways and dragging it up the grip tape to carry the momentum of the board rising upward and then you're landing on it again in this if you're doing a kickflip it's the same principle except you're popping the board and dragging your foot off and slightly down and you're basically doing this motion with your foot popping off and then back 
mm. that's it and you use your like think of like your pinky toe your pinky toe is turning downward angle flipping the board but but also doing the thing where you're kind of rising up like an ollie there you so go you, you're carrying the board up and then turning it it's not too difficult i felt like the uh i remember when i was a kid i learned how to kickflip from those old like tony hawk how-to videos if you if you all remember those mm. it was it was very very helpful to me <laughs> i remember you and matt watching them i never paid attention yeah, here's a question it's, it's, yeah it's good <laughs> I'm going to go into an answer on this and then hand it to you because I was talking about this a lot the last two days on my stream. Sure. Um, Jay Kobo says, any advice for a person who went to, say, the School of Visual Arts and due to circumstances like the COVID and his own laziness and stupidity, couldn't find internships and in art jobs and bummed by the current job market? So the job market right now, a lot of people are blaming it on AI. It's It's not that. What happened during COVID, I know so many people this has happened to recently. During COVID, video games and certain kinds of entertainment, like animated stuff and CG stuff, had a massive spike. Video game sales went crazy. People, companies were hitting record highs because everybody was stuck inside. And what happened as a result was everybody started hiring up. People started getting grants. People started getting you know money from the government to start working on projects and things. All this stimulus money went out and all these companies were having record years because people were spending stimulus money on games and stuff. So all these companies hired up, even like massive companies like, like Call of Duty and stuff, like huge, huge numbers. And then after COVID stopped being a thing and the lockdowns ended, eventually that bubble burst and the sales regulated back to what they were. And then mixed with a bunch of corporate mergers that have been happening, there's been massive layoffs all over the place and it has nothing to do with ai ai might have gotten written a few jobs but the the biggest thing right now is the fact that the covid bubble burst it's still affecting hollywood it's still affecting gaming tons of people at um what is it infinity ward just got laid off um and it's all because they merged like um the market will regulate but right now it's it is crazy right now but it's it's going to regulate it's crazy because of covid though it's crazy because things were super high and then they came back to normal and it feels like a crash but it's not it's just regulating but yeah entertainment's not going anywhere yeah the same thing happened to me and dave with the hollywood stuff when we were selling our show like the just the timing like so many things got canceled because so many animated shows got made during covid that just as a numbers game, a few succeeded and the rest didn't. And then all these people have this stigma against animation stuff now because so many of those happened and so many of them didn't work out. It's the same with gaming. Companies just like spent tons of money because things times were good for them and now it's not. And it's just, it'll it's all a, be normal. It's the same thing you're talking about with AI. It's just they flood the market with one particular thing and then yeah. there's not enough to go around. Yeah. And people lose interest because it's just kind of everywhere and people can't buy everything. Mm -hmm. It's like that that animation thing Dan's talking about is what happened to us. It's like there's yeah. just too many, too many projects. So then you mix that in with the fact that there's been a bunch of huge mergers, like record size mergers, and like that makes redundancies and then studios close because they're redundant and like things are just kind of volatile right now. That doesn't mean it's going to be that way forever, but yeah thoughts on the crow remake <laughs> that trailer stinks i didn't watch it the trailer i didn't I, I didn't I didn't even know there was a trailer yet uh yeah it's just like i don't know it's not surprising it's like exactly what i would imagine somebody would think it's basically that devil may cry uh the one with the dude with the, like the short hair it's basically oh. him. They made the crow have short hair? Yeah. Oh, man. The crow's like three things. It's long hair, a smile, and makeup. It's like, what? how do you get rid of one of the three things? He doesn't wear white makeup. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's like Batman, just not with any of the costume on. That's really good. It's just Bruce Wayne. Yeah. Just Batman. Bruce and 
Just bruising, just, just bruising around. <laughs> How did you feel about uh, Beetlejuice saying the juice is loose in the teaser trailer? I didn't see the teaser trailer. He says the juice is loose. Oh my god, dude! The whole trailer it has this huge buildup, and they're at the funeral of Lydia's dad, and it's going through the town, and it's playing the Deo song, but it's like the slow Hollywood like Deo. And then she runs upstairs, and the model's upstairs, and the model rips open, and then he comes up out of the model, and he goes, "The juice is loose," and <laughs> I loved it. I was like, "Yes, this is so dumb." I mean, I this, I like it already as long as it's not the new ghostbusters vibes no he literally <laughs> as long the as only it's stupid spoke, the only spoken line in the whole trailer is the juice is loose <laughs> like, yeah. and they called it beetlejuice beetlejuice which i think means that there's going to be a third so one much that's so much better beetlejuice yeah. Be- that's a great that's a name. great name especially if they do a third one now beetlejuice 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 it's perfect it's like yes that's so i have so much faith in it now that they changed the name and the fucking teaser didn't suck but who knows maybe it'll be bad i have no idea well that's i mean that's the that's a positive thing though calling it beetlejuice yeah. beetlejuice that's inspired. Like, hey. <laughs> yeah what a good idea it's great it's uh the title card is the gravestone and it says beetlejuice beetlejuice and then it has like ad 2024 i'm like <laughs> oh that's so smart okay someone working on this knows visual stuff that's cool yeah let's see advice on drawing fight scenes uh, um i mean during the fight i mean it's uh, exaggeration is pretty key for me personally like i like uh this is not to knock like anybody like don't take offense to this please but like uh the difference between like an X Men ninety seven versus like Chainsaw Man, like mm-hmm. watch the fight scenes between those two. I'm more of a fan of something like Chainsaw Man, where they like push and pull anatomy like elastic to mm-hmm. make impacts feel more exaggerated and force perspective shots and like lots of style and exaggeration to kind of feel the impact of things more and uh i i like that unreal approach to fight scenes versus the like static always exactly accurate anatomy like just movement of a regular body without like super dynamic shots with like you know crazy perspective and there's a couple different ways of doing it but i think that one of the reasons why people really gravitate towards like crazy fight scenes in anime is that it's that style and that approach to physical action it's Mm. they it's a very like distinct look and i i always felt that that was way more successful because it's less about the accuracy of the fight and more about the feeling and uh, you know like you even get some of that in like jackie chan movies where like in a Jackie Chan fight scene, it's very like comical how they react to getting hit. It's almost like pro wrestling ish, where they like mm. do like crazy exaggerated falls or like a million spins through the air and then slam on the ground and everybody has like powder on them. So when they get hit, you see the powder fly off. You see like an impact. Mm. So I think if you pay attention to a lot of those things, you can start to make your own like stylistic decisions of like how to sell action better. But, um, I think like really playing with that exaggeration I talked about is is key to making things like feel a certain way in your fight scenes. Hayden says, hey Dave, happy to catch you for a stream. I've watched some stream VODs in the past. Love your work. Thanks. I still got to watch Blue-Eyed Samurai season one. Oh, it's incredible. That's probably... That's probably like my number one animated, like anything in a long time. That show, that show is so good, dude. Mm. Like nothing touches that to me. Jacoba says, I'm considering going to the Art Students League, a more accessible atelier in New York to skill up and network with people. Any advice on optimizing my time there so it won't be like college? 
I mean, the networking is definitely something you should do, especially if you're in New York City. You should also probably, depending what you want to do, if you're in New York City, go to events at the Society of Illustrators, meet like Sam Weber and people who like do what you want to do. Just try to network as much as you can. Obviously, focus on your fundamentals, like study like crazy. Going there isn't going to give you a job, but the skills you learn there could help a lot. Um, but yeah, if you're in New York, I'd say networking is the, the biggest benefit to you because there's a lot of people there that you could meet that could lead to cool stuff. But yeah, Does just Sam work Weber really hard. still exist. I haven't I seen he Sam's did. work in so long. I assumed he was just doing like film stuff. I never see, I, like I remember his like book work. Unless he like, haven't seen unless he like, unless he like passed away, he has to. He was too <laughs> good to have just disappeared. Like he's got to be working on something. I feel like he disappeared. I haven't seen anything. I he's, just assumed like, he like was working on stuff he couldn't show anybody. Maybe I just haven't been paying attention. But I, you know, like it was like him and like James Jean, and then all of a sudden he was just gone. <laughs> yeah. There's a bunch of people. I think Tomer's still in New York. I think um, Yuko Shimizu is her name. I think she's still there. I th th there's a bunch of people in the New York area. But uh, yeah, network. Go to as much stuff as you can. Meet as many people as you can. Practice your skills as much as you can. But yeah. Look at other artists who went to ateliers and did something with it after, like Miles and Carla. Um, yeah, figure out what stuff you can take from it, and most of all, figure out what you want to do after. Like, figure out like what you actually want to do, and then kind of bend it towards that. Miles Johnston, Carlo Ortiz. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't think him saying the juice is loose is an OJ reference, <laughs> but that would be pretty. That would be amazing if it was. Um, it's a premonition. <laughs> Yeah, OJ's loose in the Beetlejuice The movie universe. takes place in 1994. <laughs> the juice is loose. We gotta stop him. Exactly. That's the plot. Stop Lydia, OJ we gotta Simpson. team up. We gotta stop, stop OJ, OJ Simpson. Kill his wife. <laughs> He's gonna kill his wife. I know. He's gonna kill his wife. What he gotta listen to me. And some guy is gonna try and do karate to stop him. And then she OJ's sees it on the gonna news that he killed her. <laughs> she sees it on the news. She turns around and he's doing that thing where he's sitting with one knee up, leaning against it. Well, I told you. <laughs> Get you kind of a pickle now. What did you do with this wife, Beetlejuice? She's on Mars. I'm going to write this whole movie. The Juice is Loose, Beetlejuice 5. They go to Mars to stop OJ from happening. Yeah. Dan, what's new and what have you been working on? Uh, just nothing's really new. Built a house, living here painting doing our third book uh yeah doing a bunch of elden ring stuff for a meat bun which is a clothing company and doing a bunch of square enix stuff for square enix which is a video game company <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> hold on is it bill skarsgård is he the yeah. crow yeah it's uh, it. oh. Oh. oh oh all right I wouldn't even think like if he were the way like the crow looked like the actual crow design like then I feel you like think, that'd be fine. Like do you think the no a, makeup was a do you think the no makeup was a contract thing for him or he was like I'll do it but I'm not doing another role with, with makeup. I'm not going to be the makeup guy. <laughs> it's entirely possible. I mean he is Man. wearing makeup and it is just like black eyeshadow. Or like black paint. I don't know. It's basically Death Stranding. Man. Well. Anyone else think the quote Hollywood slowdown approach with music and trailers is getting a bit out of hand? The other day I heard a slowdown version of Twist and Shut by the Beatles. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a fucking meme. And it's the slow piano keys. The slow piano keys playing the notes. No. It's trash. I mean, it's a, it's sort of like yeah, you know, people set you up for success if you pay attention. It's true. Like when you hear that sort of thing, you just go, "Oh, do the opposite of this." Mm -hmm. It's like if if only those people understood that. It's like, yes, it was maybe cool the very first, second, third time it happened. It's not cool anymore. <laughs> Stop doing it. 
I did love all the uh I, speaking of X-Men 97, I did love all the fake fans coming out being like, Cyclops would never say something this lame in the original. Thanks for ruining my childhood. And it's Cyclops being like, fine, I guess I'll surrender. Not. And then <laughs> blasting people. And then he literally, that's literally an episode from the original cartoon. <laughs> that's literally a thing he did. Like, do people not realize that that X-Men show from the 90s was kind of cheesy? Like every fucking cartoon show in the 90s? Like, it wasn't super serious and gritty. <laughs> I guess I'll surrender. Not! Yeah, that show was goofy as fuck. R.I.P. Yeah. to Rogue's ass. Say a prayer. It's gone. Did you watch it? No, I haven't watched it yet. I watched Not because I don't want to. Kids. I just haven't had time yet. I watched it with the boys one morning. Put it I on. saw Magneto's speech at the end of the new first pilot when he's like up in the air above Earth with all the politicians. He's like, normally I'd murder all of you. But Charles Xavier put me in charge of his grand vision for a better world. I'm like, whoa, we're, we're doing this? All right. I mean, I, I understand the guts it took to put Magneto in that bondage M suit, <laughs> but it didn't work. It didn't pay off. No. I don't care that it's from the original and it's an old design. Doesn't matter. It's still not a good one. <laughs> yeah. Giving, giving, I mean, I personally liked Storm with the crazy huge hair. I, I personally prefer that to the Mohawk, but the Mohawk doesn't look bad. I like but that Mohawk Stone. Storm. That M suit. <laughs> yeah. That's different. If you're going to change something and it looks cool, okay. If you're going to change I just, something. I just can't buy that he was in a, like a Warsaw ghetto. <laughs> and then where's that later on? It's, <laughs> like, it's the thing I can't buy. That's a yeah. good point, actually. You, I, you can't sell me on that. that you like, can't live through the Holocaust and then put he that survived on. the Holocaust and then put that on. I was like, I'm mm. going to wear something a young goth girl would wear. <laughs> <laughs> I That's just great. don't. I don't buy it. Hmm. Taxidermy Driver, great name, says, I remember someone pointed out that in Jackie Chan movies, they show multiple shots of the impact to make sure you really see it. Yeah, and then anime fucking ran with that compared yeah, like to a lot of think of how often like in dragon ball z they fly and then smash through a ton of rocks like yeah the best let's see you saw that girl who stole from donato right no you didn't see that mm-hmm -mm. Someone actually selected out uh, pieces of paintings from Donato and copy pasted them into a magic card. Oh no. Yeah. Like, an like actual published magic card? Yes. That's yeah. Weird. Donato and, um, oh, and Boris Vallejo. They took pieces of a Vallejo painting. Wow. Yeah. Bold move. Which one is Dave? Not me. The other one. It's me. One of us always tells the truth, and one of us always <laughs> lies. Dan, I keep trying to Guess find your YouTube. One. <laughs> I keep trying to find your YouTube or Twitch, but I keep finding your evil doppelganger. What's your channel called? It's, uh, it's youtube.com slash a bunch of numbers. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, think it's just Dan. I think it's just Dan. <laughs> <laughs> no idea. I couldn't tell you. Master Marketing one hundred and one over here. Yeah, Having I haven't figured out Dan Warren that a bunch of other people have isn't enough. Dan no. also has to hide behind a wall of numbers. Hey, it's worked out for me great. I got a five-figure contract from Webtoon, thinking I was the other Dan Warren. Okay, <laughs> marketing genius. Just be other people. <laughs> yeah, I'll just be all the other Dan Warrens. I'm the Omni Dan Warren. <laughs> They're all part of me. I'm Omega Man. <laughs> I haven't figured out how to how to simultaneously uh, stream to Twitch and YouTube. I don't think OBS can can do both at once. 
Uh, there's ways to do it it's to simulcast. Yeah, I haven't done Twitch yet because I couldn't figure out how to do that with OBS. I might have to get something else, but yeah. Um, let's see what else we got in the chat. They remaking Naked Gun, and the only way I think it could be good is to bring OJ back and tell no one and have the plot revolve around him. Are they really re remaking the Naked Gun? Yeah, with Liam. I mean, with uh, uh what's his face? Liam Chris Neeson. Hemsworth. Oh, I thought you were gonna say Liam Hemsworth. Chris Hemsworth. <laughs> Wait, Liam Neeson from like Taken? Yeah. He's the comedy guy? Yeah, have you seen his bit where he uh, speaks in a Chinese accent? No. That's unbelievable. Okay, well, hey. If it's you, not supposed I'll, to I, be funny. I'll trust you. <laughs> it's not supposed Either. to be funny. It's just the most insane choice. My Beetlejuice impression you. is impressive. Thank you. Yeah, I want to see it. He tells a story about an earthquake in a hotel. And Our then stream's still going to happen. About a, he talks about a lady that was like in the hallway of the hotel while the earthquake <laughs> was going on. And he's he's all upset <laughs> about it. And then she goes in the most racist accent ever. He goes, oh, no problem, no problem. Like he, <laughs> no, like he doesn't. He, he does that in the, no, in the thing. Dude. It's unbelievable, dude. No. It's so crazy. <laughs> It's so Is he really going to be the new Naked Gun guy, though? Yeah, I mean, if he does, like, wild shit, I'll tune in. That's insanity. I mean, he That's was what he should have done at the end of, the end of Taken. Is... He should have should have put on disguises during Taken <laughs> and put in Chinese people to throw off the scent from the human traffickers. <laughs> done that voice he just did. Delivery. Just him outside. <laughs> With his I'm sorry. Fu Manchu and all this like classic <laughs> racist yeah. stuff. That should have been the end of Taken, yeah. That would have been great. Yeah, that is fucking crazy. <sighs> oh, man. The end of stream's still going to happen. They've been happening every day for like two weeks now. Yeah, they're going to keep Dan happening. Just, like Dan said, he just doesn't know how to tell you. I just don't know how to tell you where to go. Just he go turns to my on channel. his computer. <laughs> Yep. They go on the internet. <laughs> I click go live. He doesn't know where they go. <laughs> they shut it off. <laughs> You'll find it. He just. Why is your comic so detailed? Asks Agilon. I don't know. <laughs> there you go, Agilon. Question asked, question answered. Why was I born with blue eyes? I don't know. Hmm. You gotta see Jeb. that Liam Neeson story. I, I want to. I, I mean, said I, I play the audio. Cam and she was dying. Do you want to send it to me? I'll play the audio right now so everyone can hear it. Yeah, let me find it. Wasn't it the Wayne's World movies that started that not as a thing? I couldn't tell you. And I'm glad I couldn't tell you. <laughs> if I knew that for sure. <laughs> Oh, I know. <laughs> oh, yeah, classic yes. Wayne's World bit. <laughs> that one? Dude, no stairway. Denied. Classic bit. <laughs> <laughs> what 80s cartoon should make a comeback? Um, hmm. Cool World. I don't know what year that was. <laughs> Find where Dan's thing is at. Laser Hawks. Are you sending me the Liam Neeson? Yeah. It's very good. <laughs> it's very good. My YouTube is at Dan Warren. Just Dan Warren. At Dan Warren. There you go. Dave, 80s cartoon, you want to make a comeback? An 80s cartoon. Uh, let me think. GoBots? <laughs> GoBots would be a good one. Only because I'd of love the to theme see, song. I'd love to see a deathly serious He-Man the Masters of the Universe. 
like a super well animated one where there's like themes of war <laughs> and loss. I'd Dude, I'm pretty sure I'd that's love a thing. That. I want to see it. It's a. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's the one that's on Netflix like right now. Wait a minute! I thought they were doing Shira. They did a He-Man one too. I'm almost positive there's a He-Man. Oh one man! Like that right now. Did my wish just come true in real time? Lily Malou says, "Every time I think of X-Men, I think of Storm in the live-action movie saying the amazing line. You know what happens when a toad is struck by lightning? The same thing that happens to everything else. That's a great line." It's crazy when like those are lines that you write alone at like late at night and you think like you're like listening to music when you write it. So it's like tonally wrong because like you're also listening to something that makes you think it's probably going to sound cool. And then like you read it way later and you go like, God, why did I write that corny piece of shit? That's great. (laughs) That's like 100% what that is. This badass Man. line I wrote. That movie had some some takes. Did you in the in this chat right here, Dan, the one that we're in? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Look at that video. Oh, the okay. Video. Shit, I'm able to play this so people can hear it. Hold on, I'll send it to myself. Uh, I'll send it to myself. It's okay. I can mute my, I have music on, so. Oh, how long is it? Are people gonna have to like wait? Uh, It's at the end. You can like skip to the end if you want. I just muted the music. Just skip to like halfway. He's describing a story, you know. I really hope I just sent that to someone else who isn't me. Nah, I sent it to me, damn it. I accidentally sent it to Dan Avedan from Game of Thrones. (laughs) Just racist Liam Neeson. What's up, man? I haven't talked to you in years. Enjoy this. All right. I was in a hotel on the 19th floor in the morning. Involving shoot. I've been in an earthquake before in LA. For some reason, it was different. I got it under a doorway because they all say get under a doorway. And as I was standing there in the room shaking, I thought that's crazy. So I got my passport, went out into the hallway, and the hallway was going like this. I'm not exaggerating. And there was a little lady dressed in black. It was the manageress of that floor. She was knocking on the doors with the clipboard, checking the rooms were being cleaned to the right perfection or right. She turned and saw me like this up against the door. And she said, Ah, no problem, no problem. We've been here 20 years. No problem. (laughs) Are you fucking kidding me? Isn't that the best? (laughs) Dude, he is the naked gun. He's Frank Drebin. I know. Hell yeah, dude. That's what I was saying. What the fuck, dude? If, if it's anything like that. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, yeah, I'm all in. I'm all in. Dude, no problem, no problem. It's not even the accent. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> oh. 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 oh, all right, well. It's very hey. good. Why gone Jen, everybody? Very good. For anyone just tuning in who has no idea why what that just was. Uh it's just Liam Liam Neeson's amazing Asian impression. Liam Malone. Liam Malone. <laughs> At Dave Raposa, what are you playing these days? Uh, I'm playing the the new Final Fantasy VII, mm. and then also um, well, probably gonna play Dragon's Dogma too. But uh, at 
the moment, just that. I downloaded like just fighting games, so my kids like to watch me play fighting games. So I got like Tekken 8, which I had never tried before. That's pretty good. And uh, Sorry, I, uh, fighters, Dragon Ball fighters. Sorry, I got all excited last night and was blowing up your phone with pictures of liches. I got a little too excited. <laughs> oh, yeah, I saw that. <laughs> that was good. Dude, how dope were those? It's great. Yeah, Dan's the photo mode Dragon and Dragon's Dogma. Dogma. Oh my god, the photo mode, guys. It's so incredible. Everything looks so good. I was walking around in a foggy swamp. And I was like, oh, this fog's so thick, my lantern won't even let me see five feet in front of my face. And I fell in the water and I went, that's, ugh, who knows what could be living in there? I better find a bridge. And I went across the bridge and I found a spooky gallows with a skeleton. Mm. And I said, I wonder what crime he committed to be hung in such a place. <laughs> and then his body exploded and he jumped up in the air and went, bah, ha, ha, ha. And he turned into a lich and started flying around like a goldfish with like his cloak trailing behind him like fins. And I was like, I can't take a hundred pictures of this and send them to Dave from having a gamer moment. This is amazing. Beautiful game. Beautiful game. How far did you get in FF7? I don't know. I'm trying really hard not to respond to everything you're saying with that Liam Neeson accent because we're live <laughs> and I don't want to get canceled. Uh, it's such a funny accent. It's can you not even a right. For it's not even the correct accent. If the context is you're being him, can you get canceled though? Because you're not doing it, Liam. Neeson, well, we're making fun of Liam. He's Neeson's being an Asian woman. <laughs> yeah. So he. Yeah. We're making fun of him. We're not being Asian women ourselves. So we should be safe. Yeah, but we should be able to be Asian <laughs> women ourselves. That ship has sailed. That's gone. Now we can only hope for second degree where we make fun of someone else getting canceled. I know. It's too so bad. sad. Dave and the, Dan, it was the pendulum will project. swing back. <laughs> it already is. It's coming back pretty hard. Dave and Dan, it was preparing a project and to get financed more in the fine art realm. And I got to the point where I finished the pitch and I'm just like, yeah, I'd rather draw Dragon Ball and League of Legends stuff. Thoughts? I mean, yeah, man. You do what's fun for you. So wait, they were working on their own pitch? I was preparing a project to get financed more in the fine art realm, and I got to the point where I finished the pitch, and I'm just like, man, I'd rather draw Dragon Ball and League of Legends stuff. Well, you gotta make stuff that's like the things you enjoy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like, that sounds like that's your problem, is you're trying to make something that isn't you. Don't make things that you think are going to sell. Make things that you would want to buy. King Kerr says, what up, mommy? Not much, my beautiful baby boy. Oh, Kevin Smith wrote those He-Man series? I didn't know that. Hmm. Cancel, cancel time. Wake up, babe. New ringtone just dropped. <laughs> just him saying that. That's a good idea. Don't cancel me. Cancel racist Dan over here. He did a whole Japanese section of the Steve Lichman audio. Oh my god, what? did I? Did I speak actual Japanese? You did. Did I also play a ghost samurai with a very bad American accent? Uh-huh. Mm. Tune in. Tune in. We had someone who speaks fluent Japanese translate our whole script phonetically and send it back to me so I could read just how the words are supposed to sound in English. <laughs> the worst way to translate something. And I still managed to make it sound insanely bad. But yeah, go check out that and more in our audiobooks. Over 18 hours of content, guys. Come on. Dave, great to see you guys tonight. Did you have a video on Patreon with close-ups of these brushes? Uh, a video of close-ups? Um, I mean, I have a bunch of process videos where I, I used a version of this. I mean, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think a close-up of this. I mean, I can do a close-up right now if you want. 
it looks gnarly up close. It just looks like squiggly lines. Dude, when you play Dragon's Dogma, you are gonna love the goblins. I bet. Dude, they are some 70s, they're some 1978 goblins. They jumped right out of a Frazetta painting and into that game. <laughs> There is not one ounce of anything that happened in the design world between 1978 and this game that happened to these goblins. Well, they are. I know what they're doing. I mean, like, so much of fantasy design in over there is built off of wizardry. So, like, mm. a lot of wizardry wizardry stuff is very classic fantasy. Dude, these goblins, though, specifically, you're gonna. Some of the art in this game, you're gonna just love. I bet. The best is the little tiny goblins that have human shields that are round, so they roll them like wheels and pick them up like sewer covers and hide behind them with both hands. Like, this is great. This, great is, so, this is so awesome. Like, how have I never seen this before? It's like the little goblins in Labyrinth hiding behind the shields, but it's like in a video game you can fight they're not like cutesy they're like real monster things cool idea yeah that's great want to play the new fatal fury myself is there a new one new fatal fury mm. oh i don't know new fatal fury you mean someone King chat of Fighters? said i want to play the new fatal fury myself i don't know so about that one party where I had to carry Dave, uh, that was in London, and I had to get Dave out of a bathroom and into a car and onto a plane. Yeah, I was very drunk. Yeah. That was, that was a good time. Yeah, I was hugging a toilet. Mm-hmm. I don't remember anything. I kicked the door open and I said, what did you give my friend? <laughs> you gotta get him back to America. <laughs> <laughs> is the comet going to be available for international shipping uh we'll see if it's not like astronomical prices like if i can get this to a destination i'll, I'll talk to the shippers i work with now because the people that ship steve right now they have locations overseas that can do that i just have to um figure out what that is for fulfillment i don't think i know this uh oh wait unless it's the one okay unless it's the one that happened here Raul says i wonder if dave could tell the rice cooker story again without getting canceled is that the one that happened in fall river or is that the one that happened over there when they were like over here no. okay the one where they i mean it's not a crazy story no it's not that i wouldn't crazy. i wouldn't even say that that's racist that's just accurate um, yeah yeah, that basically, like, I, I was looking for a specific rice cooker at H Mart, and um, a Korean lady helped me, and she asked what ethnicity my wife was, and I said uh, Vietnamese, and then she went, Vietnamese don't buy these rice cookers, Vietnamese buy these ones, the cheaper ones over the here. Ones. And I was like, oh, okay. Oh. Did you already say how you got turned onto this brush? Was it Piotr? Because it looks like the one he uses too, eh? Uh, yeah, Piotr. I, I asked him, I was like, how are you getting those textures? I was like, they're awesome. And then he just told me, he's like, yeah, it's in Krita. And it took me like, like it, it wasn't enough for him to just tell me, you know, I use this brush and then just <laughs> immediately understand how to use it. It took me a while. I was pretty for like I think a year I used that brush because I knew the magic it could have I just couldn't mm. figure out how to get it because like every time I used it I I would do more like broad strokes like crazier stuff like really thick lines and it just wasn't what I wanted and then I saw what uh you know I'd see like what Piotr could do with it and I was like okay there's light at the end of this tunnel if I just keep going so I just kept going and going and going and eventually I got comfortable with it and now I can use it for all sorts of things and paint and draw with it. Lava Crush asks, what percentage of working on the comic is fun and enjoyable versus I just got to get it done? This? Oh, I mean, 
uh, it's all fun and enjoyable. I am not putting a ton of pressure on myself with this. Um, yeah, it's weird. I get what you're saying. I mean, like, comics are a pain in the ass to do. They're just so mm. hard. But honestly, I've just gotten much better at drawing in the past couple of years that, like, the things that used to be a huge major pain in the ass, they've kind of gone away. Like, I, I just, like, I do these pages in maybe four hours. That's nothing for, mm. like, how crazy the pages are. Like to do something like Steve Lichman, I could probably do like four or five pages a day. We fly through that, yeah. Those go by quick. Deal. Fatal Fury City of the Wolves. Is that City of the Wolves? Is it an anime or is it a game? Oh, I don't know. I have to check that out. How do you guys prioritize projects and decide what's worth pursuing? Example, big illustrations and comics. I have many comics I want to make, but I wonder how much I can reasonably accomplish solo. Um, prioritizing is just like what, like what's fun to do and what feels like something that would be fun to do. Like Dave's really excited about doing this one now and he's been focusing on that. And like, once you pick a project, we always talk about doing that, um, that thing with the, you know, the big spreadsheet where you can just break stuff down into like accomplishable, like micro tasks. And it, it makes a big project very easy to, to complete once you get there. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I just go with like a gut feeling like certain things is like a, you know, what do you enjoy right now? If you're super excited about an idea and you keep coming back to it in your head, like over and over again, chances are there's some, gold there worth mining you know you mm. can find out what it is about that thing that you like but then it's bringing it to reality you know like if the script for this were still in this weird like limbo then i wouldn't be doing it right now i wouldn't have just started doing art the script needed to work and the script is you know it's good for what it is i mean like it's hard for me to judge more serious stuff because mm. it's like I I find it like it's just a lot of things that I think about all the time like not like straight up philosophy stuff but just like an outlook and like my relationship with the world and life and kids and all that sort of stuff I just kind of wrap it up into like a fairy tale and I know that at least it's honest and that it's mm. it's a reflection of me and how I feel about like relationships and things. So that's how I just am like, okay, I'm not pretending to be somebody else when I'm working on this. This is me. I like it. And the world feels cool. And uh, the script is good, I think, or just fine. It works. So it's like, I feel good about going through with it. Could it be better? Could I be better at every one of those things? Absolutely. But I'm not holding myself to something and I'm not like worried about anything. I just kind of am like, okay, everything is where I hope it could be. And then you kind of like refine it as you go. Like, you know, any number of projects you work on, if it feels really good in the beginning and like there's, you know, there's something there, then you just, in the same way you like refine a sketch, it's like you, you keep doing that and you make sure that that like initial energy is there and you don't like second guess yourself so much on like the core idea it's more about refining like the writing or just the pace or that sort of thing and like making sure that like when you read it to people that they understand what you mean like if if you read your script to somebody and they're like and then like you explain like what it's supposed to be about. If they don't get that from what you read to them, then there's probably some miscommunication happening where you could mm -hmm. be clearer with your ideas and be like, okay, the thing that I think this is about is a little off. Like I'm not really conveying what I want. So I need to like figure that out. But all that being said, it's like if I have an idea like that, that feels really good and you know, 
feels honest and it feels like something that's me and like I'm excited about the look and design and all this, that then that's something worth pursuing. And plus this one in particular is not a major commitment. I'm on page 18. I've sketched all the way through to the end of the thing and it's only 22 pages long. So I'm very close to the end of this. It wasn't like a crazy commitment mm. and that helps too. It's like, uh, if it's something, you know, like you also have to think of like other works. Like if you read Berserk, for instance, it's easy to kind of beat yourself up and be like, oh my God, how could I come up with a whole world that's so compelling and cool with like the struggle and all these things that this character goes through. And it's like, you think by reading that whole complete work or you know volumes of of a thing you think like i need all of that up front and i need it all to connect in interesting ways and all this stuff it's like no you don't like dan and i when we write stuff it's like we've laid enough foundation in like a thing that it's compelling enough for us where where those things just happen as we go as we keep building and building and going like oh we actually without even thinking about it we set up this other thing that we could do so it yeah. feels it feels like ooh, we actually were smart and we like figured this thing out it's like when in reality it's like a happy it's not a happy accident it's just the way stories naturally evolve it's like you yes just, you just grow with it and like you start to get like you know, it's like you just start to become fluent with your own story. And then that sort of thing just kind of naturally progresses one thing into the next. It's important to remember, too, that most people don't have the whole thing planned out when they start. Like yeah. Dave mentioned Berserk. Mira didn't have the whole thing for Berserk planned out. He changed it like a ton of times. Like he, he's very famously after the initial run of Berserk came out, he took a big break and he was like, how the hell do I do this? And then he wrote the golden age, which ended up being like the most popular arc. Like none of that was planned from the get go. Um, George R. R. Martin is saying he's still changing parts of the last two books in game, the game of Thrones series. That's why they're taking so long. Like he's all the way at the end of that, like multi-decade thing and he's still finding it. So it's but, like, and that isn't a bad thing. That's, that's no. like that. Like people can look at that from, the outside and think like oh they don't even have a clue what they're doing and it's like yeah but that's if you knew every step of the way where your story was going then yeah. nobody would be surprised the reader wouldn't be surprised it's like you need to be surprised by your own story in order to surprise anybody else because it needs to feel like something that you didn't see, even see coming and that's the stuff that's the most interesting i feel Pablo says, Dave, I bought volumes one and two of Steve Lichman. It broke me because of the exchange rate, but was totally worth it. Flay is my favorite character so far. Well, Pablo, are you going oh, yeah, to be excited you. for Steve Lichman book three with a green cover with a certain squid? Very prominent right there. I'm very happy with volume three. <laughs> me too. Volume three, I feel very good about. Like, I felt good about two, but it felt like we just went a little nuts. Two, we went a little nuts and we had to clean up a lot of stuff that we kind of regretted doing in one. We're like, we got to get this keeper thing wrapped up. Three is just like, it came together so fast. And like, there's so many good things and there's so many weird new things we found while we were doing it. And it's just, it just came together so naturally. And just genuinely like super excited and like, yeah, it feels like that. Also, we're sorry about the exchange rate, and we're very sorry about the shipping costs. We still don't know what we're going to do with the third Kickstarter, but if there is international shipping, it's going to cost a shitload, and we're really sorry. Like, I sent some books to someone who didn't get their order, like, two weeks ago in London. It cost me $95 to send those books to London just for the shipping, not the cost of the books. Yeah. Insane. When we did our first book, shipping to London was, like, 30 bucks. So... I don't know what we're going to do. We're just going to have to be upfront with people and be like, if you want these worldwide, we, we're not going to take a profit from it. We're just going to give you the cost of the shipping. It's going to be like a hundred bucks. But yeah. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, we'll do what we can. I mean, with the shippers that we have now, we might be able to figure something out where like they have enough warehouses locally enough to handle certain regions. Yeah but we'll see what it ends up being. 
there was a point in the last one where I was throwing books at people, <laughs> like in certain countries. I was just like, we, we sent it, then it would go missing or get stolen and go, we sent another one. I'd sent like five books to one person. I was like, I'm just going to give you a refund, dude. Like, I just can't, <laughs> I can't keep doing this. Yeah, there's certain regions that are just a nightmare to ship to, unfortunately. Uh, Mooney says, Dave and Dan, I know you're both more into the illustration side of things, but do you have any experience with storyboards or like anything you wish storyboarders you've worked with understood? I mean, we've we've done some storyboards for our books and for other things. And yeah, that was um, actually one of my first jobs was uh, being yeah. a storyboard artist. Yeah, Dave did that for that uh, music video for the Holy Diver cover. Yeah, that was literally like my first real industry job. Yeah. When I was 19. Um, but do we have any ex or things we wish storyboarders we worked with understood? I don't know, but that's kind of specific. No, I mean, nothing that like, maybe, I, maybe I'll have more to say on something like that later. Yeah. We're caught up on chat. That's everything. So where'd you say you're at in uh, FF7? Um, I just did the part with uh, Barrett's um, old friend. Uh, wasn't that. the acting in that super good? Yeah, I like the... Uh, I mean, I... A lot of people are saying like there's too many mini games and I'm like sure I get it but it's also cool to be like in a weird arcade shootout with a robot yeah on a that's little great. buggy car it's dope yeah that whole section was was awesome I love that like frog mech thing that Palmer's yeah. in that thing was so cool looking yeah I loved that are you guys ever going to have Brad Rigney on again sometime? Uh, if he wanted to come on, yeah, we love Brad. Yeah, probably. I mean, it's sort of the same thing as like Marco Dergevic, mm -hmm. where like, it's just like since having kids, it's, I don't know, time just vanished. But also, it's like I'm, I'm just prioritizing getting things done. It's like getting this off my plate is huge. I've been working on this, like I've had this on the back burner for years. Like, mm -hmm. I think I wrote this before my first son was born. So it's like, you know, at least five years old. Man. What other job would you consider outside of art or writing? Uh, directing? I mean, yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> that's exactly yeah. what I was going to say. I was like making movies. Yeah, directing would be sick. Making short films. Sculpting. I guess that's art, but yeah. Let's see. Stuff like Berserk intimidates me less for the scale and more for the time dedication. Well, that's kind of the scale. The idea of spending a decade plus on a single project is admirable and frightening. Yeah, yeah, it's a huge commitment. Well, I don't think, like, you'd have to do that. Like, it's, it's just... Like, I... I would look more at artists who've done like a handful of works that are just timeless. Oh, yeah. Okay. That 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 specific like manga thing in Japan, like specifically Berserk and other stuff like that, they want something that can run for a hundred years. <laughs> they want yeah. something that will never end. Like that's yeah, the whole we'll idea. Get, we'll get like, one piece. Yeah, they, they, that, that's the whole thing. They're, they're trying to, that whole market is designed around, we want something that can go forever. That doesn't mean you have to do that. You could do like five small things and be just as successful. But that specific market that Berserk is in wants a comic that can go forever. Yeah, that's just the culture of, that was like shown in whatever yeah. books. But like, I, I think like, what's a better approach is thinking I'm trying to think of a better example, but I'll just start with the British office. Like yeah. British, British shows have a great track record of only doing like a handful of episodes, like or like a couple seasons and then just ending on a high note. Mm -hmm. Just knowing when to walk away. Like that's much better than doing 
Like, it's better to do a bunch of projects that just grow over time, I feel. At least, That's like, why all me my, personally. All my favorite stuff is, is mini-series, where it's, like, Band of Brothers. It's this many episodes and it's over. Or, like, Shogun. Or, like, just give me, like, Chernobyl. Just, like, give me a really good long thing that isn't too long and then do something else. Like, we don't need The Terror Season 5. Just one season, great, done, moving on, like... I love people that are able to do that, to just leave the money on the table and go, no, we're going to do quality. Yes, there's going to be less, but it's all going to be good. <laughs> we're going to go do something else. Yeah, I like that with like the like Mike Flanagan stuff. Is that his name mm -hmm. or Finnegan? Mike Flanagan. Yeah, yeah. His, his stuff is like that. Where he just does like one shot stories. I'm very excited today. <laughs> about the uh, the Nosferatu remake. Yeah. I was thinking about it today on chat with people and um, the way that... So, looking back at The Witch, mm -hmm. the stuff I liked the most about it was that he was able to go look at the historical ideas of what they thought a witch was and, like, pull from that and do all the weird, creepy stuff that was based in, like history that people don't remember like weird things like the throwing up the birds and the kids talking in riddles and like mashing a baby into jelly and rubbing it on your broom to make it fly like all that horrible shit and all of a sudden today i was like wait a minute what if he does that for nosferatu and he looks into all the weird weird vampire lore from like eastern europe and we get a bunch more of that stuff like that would be so rad i hope that movie's good i really want it to be good yeah, me too. I, you know what we've been doing, or we've done a couple times, we mm -hmm. have like a book of really old uh, fairy tales, mm -hmm. and um, we just read them to the kids, and they're gnarly, because you know crazy shit happens in like really old fairy tales. Oh yeah, yeah. they're great. But yeah, like a lot of that sort of thing is in those, like a lot of like mm -hmm. the witch vibe. I love that. Like the three sillies is one. There's three this, sillies is good. You know what I'm talking about? I think I do. Yeah, I think that was a Perot one. I think it's. But it's like like one of them. I can't remember like everything that happens, but I just like that even at its silliest, there's like people like it's so I'm silly that that guy up. died. <laughs> yeah, like. I'm mixing it up with one, or maybe it is this one. Is it? Is it the one that's kind of like Rumpelstiltskin, but it's three visitors that come and do horrible things to them? No, it's about this guy who's like uh, gonna marry a girl, and he's like, "This girl's as silly as shit. I'm gonna go look around, and if I can't find, you know, <laughs> if I find if I find three more people sillier than her, then I'll consider marrying her." And then, <laughs> and then he goes it's around. A good and it's there's like test. one where a guy ends up like hanging himself and he's like oh that guy's a silly son of a bitch <laughs> and like that guy's so silly yeah he's so silly for hanging himself it's like something like that and then like so it goes like there's that and then there's another one where like the other silliness is this guy so it's like the spectrum is hanging yourself i'm pretty sure that's one of them and then mm -hmm. uh running and jumping into your pants and he's like this is the only way to put your pants on and he's like you're a silly idiot Dude, so All right, silly. I'll go marry that marry dumb this bitch. dumb lady. <laughs> Turns out I find a guy who jumps into his pants. I love you. <laughs> I love you, and I'll have kids with you. Yeah, we were like laughing the whole time reading it. I was like, this is I thought you were talking good. more. I thought you were talking more of the horrible ones, like when they get visited by creatures that like kill their no, whole family, or like we when... we have those in that. It, that's this is part of those. It's like okay. I'm saying, like even at the lightest side, there's like people getting like hung and stuff. <laughs> I like the one where they they make the shoes burning hot, like red hot, and they put the shoes on her feet and they burn her and they make her dance until she <laughs> dies <laughs> because she's trying to kick the shoes off. And like this is a kid story. It's a really really fun kid story. That's why I love those original Oz books. Yeah. This just awful, awful shit happens where they're like, this is Oz and you can't die. It's a fairy world where no one dies, but you can be destroyed. <laughs> I remember that reading that for the first time when I was a kid, like you can't die, but you can be destroyed. The wicked witch gets melted. She's still conscious. <laughs> she's just slime <laughs> and she can't move. And she's just suffering for eternity. It's like, uh, oh, oh, <laughs> 
like cool you get burned alive and turned into ash and blown on the wind and you're still floating around as ash going damn this sucks <laughs> <laughs> like this is this is something uh, i'd rather just die but okay the the reason like we, we read these to the kids and we don't like censor any of it you know like mm -hmm. old goldilocks and stuff like that Mm. It's like oh, it's good, you know. It's good to like be like this is actually what the story was before like it got changed. It was dark and weird, and like they get like they laugh at the parts you're supposed to laugh at, and like it's it was, still works. Right. And, but then Axel will come up with wild stories of his own, and uh, here's one. He's come up with some really good ones. Axel's come up with some really good stuff. Yeah, one of the one of my favorite ones if I'm if I'm talking about like an actual good story is that. Uh, uh, we all live in the eye of a cyclops that's in space and um, Like that there's a bunch of shit with cyclopses, but um, yeah. he was like he's at a cyclops phase for a while uh, <laughs> Dangerously close to a Game of Thrones thing Yeah, they were all in the eye of a cyclops looking out and um, What else is it? It's a bunch of stuff. I mean, the my favorite one that I told you a while ago, this is like yeah. an older story he told me, was that one about the uh, the white dragon that flies yeah. through the sky and has a blood ocean in its mouth. That, the blood ocean was sick. And yeah, it pukes, that thing was great. It pukes up a blood ocean, and then when the earth is flooded with blood, all the skeletons and zombies rise from the blood, and you have to fight the them. skeletons. Yeah, the skeletons coming out of the blood ocean in the dragon's mouth was my favorite part. It just oh, kept he, getting more metal. I was like, "This is great." He came up with one the other night where he was telling me a story about a sand shark that goes like underneath you, and then it pops out of the. Uh, it goes straight up high into the sky, and then it throws up a sword and catches it in its teeth, and then fights yeah. you. And I was like, "That's the, pretty cool, Axel." The Dark Souls boss. Yeah, and then that's this random. is one that's just funny. He said, what if my penis got so big that it became big like a planet? And then he paused and he said, planet penis. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't tell me that one. I wanted to planet surprise penis. you. I wanted to surprise Ooh, you live. That's a really good one. Yeah, planet penis. The pause with planet penis after that is really funny. The contemplative look on his planet penis. And then he said this after that, just riffing. And yeah. he went, or what if my penis grew little legs and tried to crawl away and drag me across the ground on my butt? That was another one he came up with. <laughs> That's an actual nightmare. Uh, Waking up, feeling yourself falling off the edge of the bed. It's your penis trying to run away with little tiny legs. <laughs> with a little Beetlejuice voice. Hey, what are you doing here? Come on, kid, let me go. Hey. Oh. <laughs> uh. Hey, Dave and Dan, you guys have mentioned a few times that you regret the Keeper arc. Why do you feel this way? And would you be hesitant to include him in the TV show? Uh, we regret it mostly because uh, the first first half of Steve was just one-off issues that we put online that people liked, and we kept doing more, and they were all based on an idea. It was, this issue's this, and then it's over. And then there's another idea, and then that's over. And then when we realized it had to be a book, we were like, well now it has to be about something right because like we'd never written a book before we're like this has to have like a point and like an arc and it didn't that's the thing we learned later is we didn't have to do that we could have just made a book full of one-offs and it would have been totally fine so then we had to think of like okay these aren't like archetypes in little one-off stories now these have to be characters and we took it a little too seriously so we were like there has to be an antagonist so who's the antagonist and then we we got there eventually we were like it's funny that when someone really hot suggests doing something some popular hot guy even if it's a dumb thing that people otherwise hate doing they think it's a good idea when that person suggests it and we were like well every everyone hates everything dracula is doing so if we bring in a hot vampire and we we do that and we just ran with it but then when we got to book two we were like wait a minute wrapping this up is going to take the whole book because we've split the party up Dracula's doing his thing, Steve's doing his thing, and now we have to dedicate this whole book to Steve having an arc and Dracula having an arc, and it it became less about the jokes and more about the structure. So we had to like find ways to force it to be funny after we figured out how everybody had to grow to get back to zero. Because <laughs> the whole time we were like, how do we get back to the first half of book one, back to zero, where we can just write one-offs and have fun? But 
Then you take that even further, and it's like in the third book. The third book's all structure, but it's only because we know how to do it now. The reason it sucked the first time around is because we had no clue what we were doing. We yeah, were just, we just we just thought like this equals book. Yeah, this this must be a book. We got to have it in the book. But like the third book is like all arcs and structure, but we we planned it from the get go to be that way, and they're all based on stuff we think is really funny. So it all. We didn't have to like find it halfway through and reverse engineer a book out of it. Mm -hmm. So book one and two should basically be one big book. Like it was, that it whole... was more or less we didn't understand how to like write ourselves out of situations quickly. Like it's yeah. not that the Kiefer thing is bad. It's just that we just didn't want to be in it as long as we were. And if we yeah. were the writers we are right now, we would have been able to write ourselves out of that in like four chapters or like three exactly. Chapters instead of 20 because <laughs> yeah. we kept we, we kept doing this thing where we were like oh it'd be funny if steve did this and then we'd go ah but he can't because he's still doing the kefir thing and it wouldn't make sense like we we hamstrung a lot of fun ideas with structure and that's like something we don't really do anymore if it's funny we just go no that's funny we're gonna we're gonna use it and we just like make it but work we can figure out how to have it make sense yeah but that's essentially why it would be included in a TV show, maybe for like an episode or two. But the problem with the Keeper thing is when we wrote Steve one, what we do in the shadows hadn't come out. And the whole fantasy, you know, horror monster comedy thing had wasn't a thing yet. Like what we do in the shadows, the movie wasn't a wide release yet. I don't think well, we'd even seen it. No, we saw the... I I mean, I think you saw what we do in the shadows way before we made Steve, like the original. I can't one. remember, but the Keeper joke specifically has been done to death by that TV show and other yeah, things since we wrote so the, the TV show. Yeah, we 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 wrote that joke before the show came out, and then that show and a bunch of other shows all did Kiefer Sutherland Lost Boy Vampire jokes after we had published the book. So I, I wouldn't go back to it now, not because I don't like it, but because it's been done so many times that it feels derivative. Yeah. But yeah. But yeah, that's that's the only reason we wouldn't include it is because we, we got in right at the start of that trend and it's just like exploded to the point now where a lot of the jokes we wrote have been used by other things. What did we think of the Romulus trailer? I didn't watch it. Uh, I mean, it's cool. I mean, it's just like a minute one. I mean, unless a new trailer just came out, but I saw the minute one, which I mm -hmm. thought was a good length and didn't really like reveal too much. Arch Enemy says, for both Dan and Dave, would you ever use AI if it facilitated you being able to make animated movies more feasibly? Uh, uh... If we could maybe train it on just like our own work just my own stuff yeah i don't want it to pull from a data set that has anyone else's stuff in it because that's the part that makes it unethical for me but it's like think, yeah i, I think ahead. like i still wouldn't because the problem i have with ai is just like it can kind of do mm -hmm. uh like human error but exactly not, not really and i, I like jankiness like i would rather the animation be shittier yeah and have like charm to it than be like very efficient and look very you know clinical just like sterile i don't mm -hmm. i don't want that and i i think like ai can replicate stuff and all that but everybody can see that sterile thing and you know i can spot ai so easy like it definitely has a look like it, and you can tell that it doesn't have that human thing behind it the only stuff i'd use ai for would be stuff that isn't part of the creative process and is part Color of like fills. <laughs> yeah like like the cleaning process even like okay the painting's done i have to optimize it let the eye like stuff like that like the creative stuff i wouldn't i wouldn't use it for no um let's see Doing a bunch of smaller projects is exactly why George R. R. Martin did that in the way the Game of Thrones was so good because he's just reusing all his best ideas. Yeah. I mean, it lets you explore multiple different things and you get better at certain things. Yeah, I mean, that that's kind of like I've, I have a bunch of ideas for Starvale, like short stories that I've written. And I just kind of 
I let that be like, this is the sci-fi universe that I make stuff in. It's like, this is the little like sandbox for all those ideas. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't watched the Romulus thing. I was so, I don't know, I was so bummed about what they did with the lore in Covenant that I just kind of checked out completely. I mean, I, I always go back to the Boba Fett example. Mm -hmm. Don't explain it. Just don't explain <laughs> anything, yeah. Let, me, let us whole, always be in the dark. <laughs> the whole thing that, like, aliens aren't aliens because david made them with human dna it's like so fucking dumb to me it's like it's so dumb that i it makes me hate the universe that it's in but i don't know but yeah we'll see maybe it'll be good i don't know ridley's burned me too many times well, this He's one's not made by him. Oh, then it might be good. Just executive produced. It might be good. I didn't even watch that Napoleon movie. Yeah, I didn't see it. They did the thing that they do in all those movies where they make the enemy army run onto a big field and the general goes, you're letting them get away. And the commander goes, let them run. Let them run. But sir, and he goes, I gave my orders. And you're like, oh my god, he's letting him. Oh, it's a frozen lake. Okay. Well, he's gonna shoot a cannonball and they're all gonna they're all gonna drown. I always want in those scenes, I want the general to turn and be like, Why didn't you just tell me? <laughs> yeah. Why'd you make me look like a fucking idiot in front of everybody? Hey, I'm your number two, man. The guys are looking at me like I'm an asshole now. <laughs> you just had to be yeah. clever. I don't know how many times we're gonna do. Oh, oh, it was a. Oh, he's a military genius. It was a frozen lake, and nobody knew. None of the people that live here that are fighting the battle knew that this was a frozen lake. It's like, what did you think I was gonna tell them? <laughs> like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> hmm. Is this a thing, or is this like? Do you guys use nightshade for data poisoning? Are we in a cyberpunk novel? <laughs> is that yeah, real? Is there a thing called night? Nightshade is you can run your images through it and it'll corrupt the file so that'll poison the AI if it gets fed into the system. Dude, that's that sentence you just said, taken on its own, is more cyberpunk than anything William Gibson ever wrote. Yeah, you man. can use Nightshade to poison your data in your image so the AI corrupts it when it feeds it into the system. It's amazing. Yeah, I know this steak tastes like shit. <laughs> it's amazing that that's the thing. That's a sentence we can say and not, not be joking. I know that when I bite it, it's juicy sweet. I'm putting poison into the system. Yeah, I spiked it with nightshade. <laughs> Take that. <laughs> Just sounds like Matrix lines. That's great. I want you to put me back into the Matrix. I want to be a Tilt-A-Whirl operator. <laughs> mm. With a billion dollars. <laughs> I want to be addicted to meth in an underground tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want to ever know that this happened. Remember after that when people are like, dude, and that guy is an actor. I it's want like, an OnlyFans. <laughs> yeah, I want my pussy in bio. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want to remember any of it. At Dave Raposo, when you were starting to get multiple jobs or clients, how did you manage to do client work with a personal project at the same time, or do you just focus on one thing? Uh, I didn't do personal projects. I needed to wait until I made a lot more money to really balance everything, because then I could take on less of the client work and just focus on like the handful of bigger marketing jobs and just have there be... you know, Because when I was doing all the work I was I didn't have time to do stuff like this like mm -hmm. literally I just didn't have time like if I wanted to make something like this I just had to be cool with the idea that I wouldn't be making as much money and you know I just had to get faster I had to get better at my job and and that's what I dedicated myself to was just improving like every day just trying to get better and faster and you know, 
now, like I, like I was saying, like I can do this whole, this whole page in a couple hours. It's like, that was never a thing for me in the past. I've just, I've just forced myself to be able to do it in the amount of time that I have from repetition. Like I couldn't have done this years ago. I wasn't quick enough. At least not with times. like other jobs. Yeah. Yeah, I tried a few times. Yeah, the momentum dies if you can't keep something consistent mm -hmm. going. And that all comes down to like, are you able to like fund this project? You know, if you have a, a Kickstarter and all that and you get some money up front and you can build these things, like that's a risk too. And you're suddenly, you know, under the gun with a bunch of people and you mm -hmm. have their money and it's like, you gotta get the funds from somewhere to make these things. And so you're either doing it on your own by taking on the work or sacrificing time or, or doing crowdfunding or whatever. But I didn't tell I, you I didn't about like doing I don't like doing that part of it. I just realized I didn't tell you about the detective because you've been so busy. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Good start. Uh, I went to that party that I cooked that thing for uh, down the street. Sure. And uh, I walked in, and it was fine. It was just a normal party. I wasn't planning on staying super long. And uh, I was in the room, in the back room. And everybody was like, we're going to go play Cards Against Humanity. Who's in? And I was like, I think I got to go home. Because that's what I always do when people bust out Cards Against Humanity. I leave. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they play. <laughs> Anybody who's playing Cards Against Humanity, come on, come in the back room. You're like, no kids allowed. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go home. And uh, <laughs> this, this, me and this other guy didn't get up to go play. And the other guy was, he looked, I swear to God, I wish I had a picture. He looked just like the main character in that Hannibal show, the This Is My Design guy with like the scruffy hair and the unshaven face. Absolutely. He looked just like that guy. And um, <laughs> so everybody left and I, I went to, I went to get up and go. And he was like, so what do you do? And I was like, me? <laughs> He was like, yeah, I was like, oh, I'm an illustrator. And he was like, oh, he was like, how do you know these guys? And I was like, I live down the street. And he was like, in that new house? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, oh. And I was like, what do you do? And he was like, I'm a detective. <laughs> and I was like, oh, and I was like, what, uh, like, like around here? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, homicides and stuff or thefts? And he was like, drugs, drugs and homicides. And I was like, okay. And he was like, yeah, I've seen some shit. And I was like, yeah, there's some bad shit around here. There's a lot of drugs. Or just talking. And then randomly in the middle of talking, he goes, you know that case up in Duxbury last year, the woman who hung all her kids? And I was like, no, I don't know that one. And he was like, how'd you miss it? It was all over the news. And I was like, I don't really watch the news. And he was like, oh my God, this crazy bitch, man. I'm telling you. <laughs> She's going to get off, too. You mark my word. She's going to go in there and say, oh, I was temporarily insane. And she's going to walk. You watch. The bitch is going to fucking walk. And I was like, well, what happened? And he was like, oh, she put all the kids up in the attic. She threw a big fit. Her husband called us. We came there. We said, uh, where's the kids? <laughs> the guy said, oh, they're upstairs. Can you go check on them? My wife's up there. So we go upstairs. This bitch jumps out the window, breaks both of her legs. So we chase her downstairs to see if she's okay. Little do we know, she hung all of her kids. And I was like, did they live? And he was like, no, they're all dead. Holy shit. And then his, then his wife comes in the room and she goes, what are you guys talking about? Like a very like cheerleadery wife. Uh -huh. And I'm like, we're just talking about work. <laughs> and, and she's like, work? He was like, this guy needs a vacation, but he doesn't want to go anywhere. And he was like, honey. <laughs> and she's like, am I right though? She said, it took me years to convince him to take me to Versailles. We're going this summer. I can't wait to go. And I was like, oh, you're going to love it. France is great. She was like, oh, my God, you've been. You're trapped. This is awesome. See, I told you. So then she leaves the room. <laughs> and then he takes a big sigh, and he pulls out a pack of cigarettes. And he literally says this line. <laughs> he says, uh, you know, I don't want to go, but I got to. I love her. She wants to go and I got to take her, but she doesn't realize that after you've seen the things I've seen, there's no vacations. And then he goes outside and smokes. I was like, I'm in a movie. I'm in a movie world. 
And then they went home and they didn't play Cards Against Humanity. That's good. That's That's the best line I've ever heard. You've seen the things I've seen. There's no vacations. Oh, my God. (laughs) I never looked up that news story about the lady hanging her kids. I didn't want to know if he made it up. Didn't look it up. Don't want to look it up. (laughs) Anyway, there you go. That's good. Very good. That's really good. Detective man. Did you did you want to tell the story of what happened? I mean, not to go into like too many details, but just down the street. Down the street. Oh, the horrible thing. Yeah, that was crazy. Because there's like yeah. a string of like fires. So there's been um there's been three fatal fires in this in like a three week span in my neighborhood. The first one, a house burnt down, and um, there were two twin girls in there with the grandmother. The grandmother is in critical condition. One of the twins went in to save her sister, saved her sister, and then died in the process. Insane. Um, Awful. Then there was another one in the middle of town where somebody died like two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And then a few days ago, I woke up at like five in the morning to take my mom up for uh, cancer stuff at the hospital. She's fine. She's in remission, but she has to get updates to make sure it's not coming back. Um, So I woke up and I went outside and there was just police everywhere. And I was like, what is going like all over the place I live, like all over the cranberry bog, all down the street. So I got in my car and they were like directing traffic around and telling me where to go to like not block the news shots because there were news vans and cameras. And I was like, what happened? And they were like, big fire. And I was like, which house? Because like, there's a lot of trees here. You can't, a lot of the houses are set back. I couldn't see any smoke. And I was like, they were like, there's nothing left. And I was like, I slept through that? Like, this is like within like a couple hundred feet of my house. Like, I can't believe I slept through it. And um, I kept going. And sure enough, someone's house had burned down completely. There was a bunch of news vans and shit everywhere. I picked my mom up, took her to the hospital. A few hours later, I go, we got a call from my father. And um, I didn't know this. I didn't know this guy lived there because it was a setback house in the woods. Apparently, it was like an old friend of theirs who was like in their wedding party and he just died. The house just burned down with him in it. He's like, there's like photos of like him and my dad hanging out when they were like 16, like at my parents' house. Like I did not have any clue. But now everyone's like freaking out because three fatal fires in three weeks almost feels like there's like an arsonist yeah, like it sounds we're like all kind of like what the fuck is going on that there's been three in like as many weeks but uh yeah i don't know what's close. going on yeah i wasn't gonna bring that up i i for, uh, yeah because there's no like funny ending to that other than but it's crazy yeah it's, it's crazy. crazy to have that be like i mean you know your family's yeah you know, related to it yeah, I know. My, my dad's still kind of a mess about it. He's all fucked up. But uh, because yeah, he was like, he, he was the, the, the guy who died was the, was the guy my dad used to like teach us a lesson as a kid about don't drink because he was like a big time alcoholic. Yeah. So my, my, my dad would always hire this guy to come over and do like small jobs around the house. And the guy would always be shit faced and like falling off ladders and stuff. And my dad would always pull us aside and be like, you see, that's why you never want to drink you don't want to end up like him he's my friend and i love him and i'll always look out for him but you can't drink or that's what you're going to turn into like he was that guy and i'm just like he's just yeah it's just wild it's just wild that it burned down but yeah we'll see what happens i mean well we were talking about dan was going to sit out on his jacuzzi and wait for the arsonist to come back around and go when he's at the next house and go hey over here over here do me this one do me, do me. This house. Hey, this one, please. <laughs> I'm ready. It was so funny because I was I was cooking the other night at like two in the morning, so I couldn't sleep, and uh, my fire alarm went off. So I was cooking a steak, <laughs> and I swear to, because it was so loud in the middle of the night, I was like, someone's gonna think my house is burning down. I was like, one of my neighbors <laughs> is gonna run over here. Cause I like, I had to open the door to let the smoke out of the kitchen and I live on a lake. So across the whole lake, it's like, eh, 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 eh. Like, just like, oh, great, great. Everyone's gonna just think my house is burning down. Just run out of your living room full speed on fire. Just blast <laughs> through your railing into the lake. <laughs> yeah, just full speed. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Hopefully the detective's on it. 
the detective I met. Hopefully he's looking into the string of fires. I got a detective who lives next door. Hmm. Tell me about him. I don't know a ton about him yet. He's a lot older and he's not like, like I've never had the opportunity to actually talk to him completely. Like we, you know, Kim's like made food for them and stuff. And we brought like desserts to their house and Kim's made them like bread and, mm-hmm. and they've done stuff for us. Like, uh, snow blow, like our walk and all that, you know, sidewalk, like we're in a corner and our, our corner's pretty big for, you know, Jeez. having a shovel. So he comes over and does all that stuff sometimes, which is really nice. But other than that, nothing yet. I'm hopeful, though. I'm hopeful that he has some wild stuff to, to tell me. I'm looking at this Duxbury thing right now just because I'm, I'm curious. It looks like it's true. She did hang three children and then jump out a window to try and kill herself. Jesus. Jesus. Fuck, that's dark. Anyway... What's up, everybody? Story time. Yeah, I'm probably gonna hop off of here. Question from The. Do you remember how much money you made the first year doing art? How much did the clients pay back then for various tips of work? Now, it's gonna be different. First year where Dave was like full-time professional or first year ever freelancing when he was like 18? Because that's gonna be very different. Yeah, I mean, when I was like a 19-year-old and I was working, I probably made like, I don't know, I, I want to say like the first year I, I asked my dad, I was like, what should I do about taxes? And he's like, how much did you make? And I was like, I don't know, like 12,000 bucks. And he was just like, nothing. You don't have mm-hmm. to do taxes. <laughs> like, Yeah. Uh, I can't remember what that first year was like. I was trying really hard. Like I, I worked for a ton of people and I just didn't get paid a lot cause I, I wasn't fast and I, yeah, I couldn't really get it to mm. work. But, um, I think like my first, my first like serious year, I don't know. I, I probably made around like 30 or so thousand. I want to say that was like when I was doing like wizards of the coast, like every month. And uh, mm. I had, you know, other RPG jobs, and I, I was like, go. I was like, hustling pretty hard, like, working for everybody I could, and I just wanted to get good as fast as possible. So I, I had a, you know, there was there were times where I would have every single month I would I would have at least some months I had ten clients at once, mm. and other months it would be like five but it was always in that range so i'd be working all day all night constant and i don't uh, miss that that was when i was living in boston i did that i fucking hated i did that for three years i don't know how you did it for 10. yeah i mean well i've been a freelancer for almost two decades now i know I, i think i've been a freelancer longer than most artists i think i'm in like a very rare category but um yeah i mean it's a huge undertaking but once you get once you once you get it under control like it takes that long to have just like a a really well-oiled like machine where you have a number of clients that just constantly are giving you work uh yeah my first big year like six figure year I, I was working in advertising and I think I made like 120,000 or something like that for a year. And those were like, those were crazy jobs. Cause they would ask me to work random hours of the night. Like I'd get calls, like we need this thing in you know, less than 24 hours, like eight hours. We need this thing. And it'd be like I remember that. midnight when they called me. Mm-hmm. So I'd be like, oh, okay, I'm going to stay up tonight and work on this. But then I would, I would have them pay me like accordingly so i'd be like okay you're, you're making me stay up all night work on, on this thing and i'm the only artist who's like willing to do this so like this is how much i want and i could kind of name my price in that field and so i did that for like a couple of years 
and um those years were like that but they were like they were high like income years back then but Mm -hmm. not like it, it wasn't sustainable it wasn't something that like i could do forever it was just too much and uh it only became like truly sustainable i don't know i i got comfortable maybe like 10 years ago was when i started to get comfortable that was when i started to get like regular i found like easier ways to make money where i was like okay instead of doing every job be painting where it takes forever i'm just going to get a bunch of jobs that are like sketch work and like quick things that i can work together for movie poster concepts and, and just like jobs that had quick turnaround times but they also were pretty easy like mm. those those were the ones where i could make just as much money and less time so like I, I could do more of them even if they didn't pay they didn't pay as much per piece over time just my time spent working i could make more and that that was how i uh started to get a little more comfortable then we and, discovered passive income with the steve books and that's a whole yeah. game changer yeah having like an actual thing that exists in the world and doesn't need continual additive work to it in order to bring in money like that's a huge thing mm-hmm. and then like you know being able to sell a, a property to somebody like that's another I, that's another money making thing but mm-hmm. like each one of those you know comes with its own process and whatever but like nowadays it's just nice to take on like a handful of really big jobs like i have a consistent game job i've been working on for three years now and uh that job is great it's just like a monthly paycheck i log in hours i work about three days a week right now two of the days of the week i devote to doing freelance and then nights are freelance as well if i have to but uh yeah it's like the patreon steve books it's like you really you really want to like if you want to survive in freelance it's like you, you really do need to like actively be yourself as well like make things and like not completely rely on everybody else to give you stuff because then you control your life a bit more it's like having the steve books having to be like something that exists this tangible object that can just perpetually make some sort of income is like nice because it's just you did it once <laughs> it's hard you did it once but it, that's it it's like so that stuff's very important but it's all difficult to balance and i don't like whenever anybody asks like help on those things i just kind of say like you know it's a it's going to be like up to how much you want to put into it because being a freelancer is just yeah. honestly i think it's just the hardest way to go about it Remember that what Dave's talking about specifically applies to if you go full freelance. If you're working in house, your first year as an artist, you might make anywhere from sixty to a hundred k. But that's in house. That's not freelance. Yeah, freelance. You know, like I don't know. Like I remember, like back in the day, being like shocked at what people were making and, and just being like, like now I think about it with like what I'm able to pull in from like work, mm. and I'm like oh okay like i get it now i get like that level now and what it takes but like yeah it's just a lot of work none of it's none of it's uh ideal hours in the beginning <laughs> it's all crazy gonna do gonna do a last question about patreon stuff uh sure if that's there Maester Blaster says, uh, for the next Patreon exercise, are participants doing concepts as well, or is it more suggestions to see how you would handle the suggestions? Uh, it's going to be like a voting system. So like, we're going to vote on the type of game, the genre, the style, like all of that sort of thing is going to be down to like what people in our Discord art committee dictate like whatever whatever it ends up whatever direction it goes in is going to be up to everybody and i just want to show you like just given what i've learned through my career how i would approach that and just give you an idea of what it's actually like to work on a game and that'll walk through 
character development, voting on like designs, silhouettes, like all that sort of stuff, the same way I'd submit to an art director and then how I then move on to the next step. And it's gonna be a bit more streamlined than it would in a video game where there'd be all sorts of random crazy things that would happen. So I'm gonna simplify it slightly, but essentially doing like characters, lineup, you know, design of the style of the game, and then also doing like a key art and that sort of development. That's the idea anyway. And then we just build it all together and I show you how that process works. It's gonna be hopefully a nice thing to kind of point to for everybody who's ever asking about like how game job pipeline works and that sort of thing. Anybody who's ever been curious of like what that process actually looks like. So that's what it's going to be. And if you like the IP that we end up making through this challenge, then of course feel free to riff on it, add stuff, join in. There's no like absolutes with this. I'm not saying like this is all my thing and you just watch. <laughs> you don't have to, you can be a part of it, but that's going to be the, the bulk of it is using the Discord as an art director to guide this game. But yeah. Yeah. I actually made a ton of progress on this uh, page. I only have one panel left. Looking good. I feel good. Thank you all for hanging out. I appreciate it. Thanks for all the questions. Thanks, Dan, for hanging out. Yeah, of course. Anytime. And uh, yeah, um, just to kind of bring it back, I'll show you the next thing. This this Venom uh, two, two, around two hour painting demo I did to <laughs> walk through my entire current painting process. That's going to be up on the um, uh, Patreon. And everything else that I've been wanting to put up on the Patreon should be going up shortly. I have everything broken down. And um, yeah, I'm going to be doing like a barrage of posts kind of back to back because it's been a while. So if you want to check that out when that comes out, I'll do the voiceover um, probably tomorrow. And then that'll, that'll be a thing that you can watch. And uh, hopefully get something from because I feel like I've really streamlined my painting technique where I feel very quick now like this this venom wouldn't have taken me two hours a year ago so that's also thanks to having the pressure of working on Diablo and having my work be promo stuff for that yeah so that that's been a nice kind of kick in the ass to just get better but uh yeah Thank you all so much, and uh, I'll see you next. Well, actually, I, oh yeah, I do have to say, um, I'm going to be out going on a, a trip with my family from the 3rd to the 9th? Yeah, the 9th. The 3rd to the 9th. So there probably won't be a stream next week, but every other, you know, Every Thursday after that, we'll have the regular streams. But there you go. Love to you all. See you next time. Hope you have a, a great Easter. Go look for all the eggs. Go eat all the eggs you can. Go to the grocery stores. Swallow the eggs like a snake. Uh, kill a rabbit. Whoa. Be a man. Whoa. Everyone. Do it. Do your best Asian accent. Yeah, right, you owe it to yourself. <laughs> Later. <laughs>